Okay, our case is RS, three and a half years old male from Dingras, Ilocos Norte, who was brought to the hospital because of chronic cough and seizure. For the history of present illness, patient was born preterm to a gravitas seven para six with OB score of six zero zero six at home with noted poor cry and cyanosis at birth. Thus, he was rushed to a government hospital and was admitted for five weeks with a diagnosis of hypoxemic ischemic encephalopathy, prematurity, and sepsis. Mother denies any problem during her pregnancy. She was discharge improved. However, he developed recurrent a febrile seizure in his third month of life, thus requiring hospitalization. He was diagnosed then to have epilepsy generalized, secondary to hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, and he was given phenobarbital as his maintenance anti-epileptic drug. At seven months of age, mother noted spastic extremities and head control was poor. She then consulted the patient, or she then consulted and the patient was diagnosed to have cerebral palsy. Diagnostic workups were requested, and patient was referred to rehabilitation medicine for therapy. For the interval history, patient is regularly taking his anti-epileptic drugs and occasionally visits the rehabilitation center for physical therapy. He was seizure-free for more than a year. However, at two and a half years of age, there was recurrence of seizure. He was brought back to the hospital and anti-epileptic drug was adjusted. During this time, the mother also disclosed that he has regular bouts of cough and colds almost every other month. He was hospitalized two times at the district hospital for pneumonia. One month prior to admission or prior to consult, patients still had occasional episodes of cough and seizures. He was brought to the health center and was given salbutamol and advised to consult a specialist. Progression of cough and seizures prompted consult. Growth and development milestones are as follows. For the pertinent physical examination findings, patient was being carried by the mother, patient was asleep and afebrile with the following vital signs, weight of 8.8 .8 kilograms and length of 72 centimeters. For the pertinent per P findings, patient had subcostal retractions, occasional ronchi on both lung fields, and a scaphoid abdomen. For the neurologic examination, patient was with spontaneous eye opening and movement of extremities. Patient was not oriented and does not follow commands. Cranial nerves were normal and intact. There were no lateralizing signs with spastic extremities. The present working impression then was Pneumonia rule out aspiration, epilepsy generalized, secondary to hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, cerebral palsy, spastic quadriplegic, global developmental delay, and malnutrition. With the case we presented, well, current problems that we need to address are the following. First, the burden of cerebral palsy. Is there a treatment for cerebral palsy? Second, the addition or titration of his anti-epileptic drug because of uncontrolled seizures. Third, addressing the recurrent bouts of pneumonia. And last, addressing the nutritional status of the patient. To answer all these questions, we have invited four experts tonight to share their thoughts and insights in managing such multidisciplinary neurologic case. Our first lecture tonight will be given by Dr. Jo Anviado. So good evening. Thank you for that kind introduction, Dr. Jones. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Efren Balanag, our president, the board, no, for inviting me to give a talk on this special topic that is actually uh, close to my heart, the child with cerebral palsy. So this is my disclosure. Uh, I think that the topic on brain development always interest us pediatricians. And we all know that promotion of optimal brain development always will lead no, to maximizing the full potential of our children. 
Uh, we pediatricians are very familiar with this critical period in human development. I would just like to emphasize that your brain is the first organ to develop and the last one to mature. So it's actually from conception to birth to up to 22 years old, we're in there's still some form of neuronal connection, synaptogenesis, dendritic arborizations, and pruning that's happening to the brain. But what if during the critical period of development, the following risk factors occurred? Definitely this, this will cause damage to the developing brain that will lead to lifelong disability, especially in physical health of the patient that will eventually lead to this to develop cerebral palsy. Now, this will be the objectives of my 15 to 20 minute talk. Hopefully, at the end of my lecture, the participant should be able to do the following. So spare me some of your time and your effort. I would just like to post a poll question on how many patients with cerebral palsy do you see in your clinic in a month? There's no right or wrong, okay? So A, one to five, B, five to 10, C, more than 10, and D, none. So can you please type in your vote? So we can see how many of you uh, manage patients with cerebral palsy. So majority no, of the respondents actually <clears throat> uh, voted uh, A, no, one to five, cases. So if we are around 200, so we see 200 cases of cerebral palsy in a month. So that's actually a lot in Northern Luzon. So cerebral palsy is the most common motor disability in childhood. And in a population-based study worldwide, the prevalence of CP is around 1.5 to 4 percent. No? 1.5 to 4 per 1,000 live births. And if it's coupled with comorbidity like your autism, it actually increases in 1 is to 323. So this is the statistics from the Philippine Pediatric Society among all the training institutions nationwide. And you can see that there are around 16,000 cases from January 2006 to September 2020. But what actually caught my attention is the uh, cerebral palsy and specified classification comprising more than two thirds. So hopefully at the end of my lecture, we will be more confident in classifying what specific type of cerebral palsy your patient really has and not just putting it in the unspecified category. So this is the contribution of our chapter among the five training institutions in <coughs> still no, the unspecified top the number or the list. So among us child neurologists, we had a database collection from March 2015 to June 2018. No, this is just from the private pediatric neurologists. We weren't able to include the training hospitals because of ethical problems. And uh, we had the most number of cerebral palsy patients who are actually quadriplegic. There's been a debate when it comes to the development, uh, when it comes to the definition of your cerebral palsy. You know, since time and again, from 1994, several annotations were actually made. No? For this time, this current definition, which was published in the Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology, states that cerebral palsy describes a group of permanent disorders of the development of movement and posture, causing activity limitation that are attributed to non-progressive disturbances that occurred in the developing fetal or infant brain. The motor disorders of cerebral palsy are often accompanied by disturbances of sensation, perception, cognition, communication and behavior, and by epilepsy and secondary musculoskeletal problems. Different annotations, but these specific phrases are permanent. Okay, it is a permanent disorders of the development of movement and posture, meaning all the transient disorders are excluded. It is a non-progressive disturbance <clears throat> wherein the presumed etiology of CP can either be an event or a series of event, event that occurred in the developing brain. However, it's no longer active during the time of the diagnosis and the lesion should be there during the developing brain 
or during the fetal period or infancy. So definitely, when you diagnose cerebral palsy, it will not include this following disorders because these are all progressive lesions, okay? From spinal cord disorder, muscular disorder, that we already know is progressive as the time progresses, okay? So although the clinical manifestations of CP will change over time, what is definite is the underlying pathology is non-progressive. No? So for all the residents and the training, now this is a static lesion, it's a non-progressive lesion that actually brought about cerebral palsy. We often see these comorbidities with cerebral palsy. No? We rarely diagnose patients as just having cerebral palsy. Usually we have cognitive and learning difficulties. No? What are prominent are seizures or epilepsy, pulmonary problem, challenges in growth and nutrition, constipation, increased salivation, and this will be discussed later on by my co-presenters. Please don't change the channel, even though it's actually a very long night. So hopefully you will all learn from the four of us. So how we do we diagnose cerebral palsy? The importance of history taking and physical examination and neurologic examination cannot be overemphasized in diagnosing cerebral palsy. Okay, you have to get a thorough history from conception to birth, you know, the different motor developmental milestone of your patient because any delay in the motor development of a child, you, know, you already suspect a child as having cerebral palsy. These are the following risk factors that we can get you know, when you do a thorough history in this patient. The prenatal factors. No, you just have to read on these. We have several tables in the book no, discussing the prenatal risk factors for developing cerebral palsy. But mostly, the cause of cerebral palsy belongs to the perinatal risk factors, especially preterm infants that are small for gestational age. No? In the advent of new technology, we all know that the neonatologists really are very good and they can handle even the lowest, no, the very low birth weight premature. There's an increase no, in the uh, treatment and the outcome of this premature patient. However, no, it was found out that we actually also have an increase in the number of cerebral palsy among these preterm babies. Postnatal risk factors are the following. Now you have to remember that all of this should occur in the developing brain. Okay, postnatal risk factors are developed are the following. It is important to note the different risk factors because it will aid you and help you in prognosticating this type of patient. So physical examination, motor and tone are the most visible you know, during the physical examination. By handling them, not just give around one to two minutes, not checking for the deep tendon reflexes, checking for the primitive reflexes and the motor development. You can already identify if your patient is hypospastic, if your patient has normal tone, if your patient has hypotonic. Remember that a, a delay in the infant's achievement of motor milestones, it was, is uh, what usually cause, you no, know, or primary reason of consult in your clinic. So you have to be equipped you know, with the knowledge of the different developmental milestones, especially the motor, when doing that examination. And for sweet pediatricians, we already know that. So you should remember that like epilepsy, cerebral palsy is a clinical diagnosis. Okay, so what are the types of cerebral palsy? The classification of cerebral palsy will be based on severity level, on motor function, on topographical distribution, and based on gross motor function classification system. So it's actually a lot, no? But I will not be uh, giving so much information. It's actually just easy, no? When we talk about the classification based on severity level, mild, of course, the child can move without assistance. His or her daily activities are not limited. For moderate, the child will need braces, medications and adaptive technology to accomplish the daily activities. And of course, severe patients will really need their caregiver not to do all the activities of their daily living. 
So when we talk about muscle tone, you already know this, spastic and non-spastic are the mixed type. This is the most common classification that's based on uh, the ICD-10 is actually based on your topographical distribution. When you say plegia, it means uh, par paralysis, meaning there's no movement. When you say paresis, no, there's still some movement, that, but the patient cannot do the full range of motion. Uh, so to show this more visually, so we diagnose patient with cerebral palsy as having hemiplegia if the one side of the body is affected. No? So the localization will build the contralateral cerebral cortex. Diplegia, no? lower extremities are more severely affected compared to the upper extremities. Quadriplegia or quadriparetic patients, no? all the four limbs are actually not having the full range of motion. When we talk about extra pyramidal, it pertains to the deep gray matter as the localization of the lesion. So you have your atetoid type, your dystonic type. Likewise, if you have a cerebellar problem, no, your CP will present as a toxic type. So hopefully, no, uh, you already know all this topographical distribution. So the gross motor function classification, it's now expanded and revised. No? You can see the full uh, definition in this website, if you really want to learn more on this, it's based on the mobility of the child. And it's actually uh, in different languages and family settings can uh, also be downloaded, no? So if you want to learn more about this classification, it has five levels and it is used for patients less than two years old up to 18 years of age. So it has five bands, no? Less than two, two to four, four to six, six to 12, and 12 to 18. So it's applicable on all age group. So for our patient that was presented a while ago, so the classification of CP is actually based on severity. The, pa the patient has a severe type. Muscle tone, your patient has spastic. Topographical location is quadriparetic and the GMFCS classification is five. So if we actually diagnose patient, our patient, the di complete diagnosis for cerebral palsy is cerebral palsy severe, spastic, quadriparetic, GMF CS5, secondary to hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So how do we go about helping this patient? So this, since this is a multi-systemic disease, no, it requires a multidisciplinary intervention from all the doctors, orthopedic surgeons, therapies, social workers, and everything no, supporting the family and the child. So this is the mainstay for treatment, physical, occupational, and speech therapy. There are already several uh, researches regarding the use and the benefit of this therapy, and early intervention will actually yield to a more uh, progress in the motor development and speech of these children. So we really recommend you no know, physical, occupational, and speech therapy. This is just an example of a therapy that's being used you now in the US. It's called Bobath Concepts, and it yielded good result when it comes to the motor development of patients with cerebral palsy. Now, I would just like to show you a picture of a deli and Thera suit. No, um, these suits actually does not limit the motion. No. This child just need to have an extra effort to do the motion. So it is adjustable. It's definitely custom made. It's very expensive. I checked Shopee, I checked Lazada, I checked Amazon. I really cannot find the price. So it's custom made. No? So hopefully, I haven't seen one yet. So hopefully we'll be able to, in the future, all of CV patients, now this should be accessible to them and affordable as well. Now, spasticity is one common problem that we encounter. More than 50% of patients with CP actually has spasticity. Now, this leads to my second question. Now, hopefully, no, you'll be able to answer anything. No, it's up to you. So, which of the following drugs are uh, can be given for a generalized spasticity? Diazepam, Dizanidine, Dantrolene, Baclofen, or Botulinum Toxin Type A. So uh, can you please type your answer? So
So, so actually, most of you got it right. Okay, so botulinum yung type A is not the drug, no? It's actually uh, indicated for segmental or localized spasticity. So these are the drugs for spasticity, no? As given by the American Academy of Neurology and the T Child Neurology Society of uh, U.S. We usually use diazepam for generalized spasticity, but just a short course because of its uh, toxic toxic effect like somnolence, maximum uh, salivation, more weakness. So we usually shy away from using diazepam. Dizanidine is also a muscle relaxant. No, we don't have it in the country and because of its liver toxicity effect, you know, we re don't recommend it. Your dantrolene and baclofen, we cannot refute it's the, act, the possible effect of this. Your all or baclofen is what we commonly see. There's really no clear-cut randomized controlled trial with the use of your baclofen. However, no, based on experience, it actually can help. Coupled with the physical therapy, it can help patients um, decrease spasticity. As I've mentioned a while ago, the botulinum toxin type A is uh, the one that is recommended for segmental or localized spasticity. I'm sure you've heard about stem cell therapy. Stem cell therapy in CP apparently has uh, three mechanisms uh, for regeneration, as anti-inflammatory and tropic effect. To date, there are around 29 studies. However, no, the number of participants are very small and they don't still recommend the use of stem cell therapy in CP. However, among all the new medications or among all the new, the new interventions, stem cell uh, shows a promising effect. So we'll wait for further studies when it comes to stem cell therapy in your cerebral palsy. The hype or the high of medical marijuana, no? So your cannabis sativa is comprised of your tetrahydroxycannabinol and cannabinadiol, which have gained the popularity because of its indication in the intractable epilepsy. However, it was also found out that it can decrease spasticity. There was only one study to date no, by a child neurologist using this cannabis for spasticity. Uh, the result was actually good. No? There was decrease in the spasticity of patients with CP. However, there are only few patients. So again, they don't recommend it at this point in time. Now, another drug that has a neuroanti-inflammatory effect and anti-apoptotic effect in your brainstem is erythropoietin. You know? There was a study in uh, South Korea, you know, sa mga K-drama fanatic dyan, you know? this was actually done in South Korea among patients six months to three years of age given erythropoietin for eight weeks. The result was actually good. However, there was also few participants, so up to this time, it's not yet recommended. So we just hope that there will really be more studies when it comes to your erythropoietin use in patients with spasticity. Now, these are the new treatments that is uh, actually in the clinical phase one, uh, in the phase one clinical trial. Your selective dorsal rhizotomy, and the newest one is your hyperbaric oxygen therapy that apparently on the premise that it can decrease the inflammation of your brain cells. So we'll wait for the result for this new treatments for cerebral palsy and hopefully it will have a good outcome. So what will happen to our patient? No? These are the poor prognostic signs. I'm sure you have several patients who has this type of uh, disability. So you can tell you know, who will have a better prognosis or a poor prognosis. So if a child is already more than four years old and does not achieve seating balance, definitely independent ambulation will rarely be achieved. So they will not be able to walk anymore and ambulate on their own. So if a child is two to four years of age and cannot sit without support on their own, this is a poor prognosis. Ambulation mostly will not be achieved. And if the child has persistence of three or more primitive reflexes, like for example, um, Moro, Babinski, Palmer grasp, then these are actually poor prognosis signs. So in our case, in the case of our patient who is quadriplegic and spastic, so I think no, uh, independent ambulation is actually hopefully no, or poorly attainable. So how about 
currently right now in COVID pandemic, we have problem in the area because most therapy centers are closed. Now, the stock or the stimulation activity center in the Gupan, Baguio, Ilocosur, and Ilocos North are actually closed right now because of pandemic. And mostly, SPED also are closed. So there are several private uh, therapy centers that offer teleconsult. However, majority of my patients or our patients cannot afford them. So please know, as pediatricians, if we are having a hard time helping this patient, be sympathetic towards them and give you know, the medications that they need so that they will not be admitted you know, later on in the hospital. So I want to end by telling you everyone, and I think this is already not new to you, that cerebral palsy is a lifelong condition. It's really very sad that up to this point, no, we really have no specific cure for this disease. No? So we just have to maximize everything that are actually present in our locality to help no, this patient reach their full potential. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for your kind attention and for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Rejo 